Well, good morning. Welcome, everybody. It's such a blessing to see you here this morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for joining us from home. I pray that you can hear us and see us well from home. Uh, we literally about two seconds left on the countdown. Got audio going there, so hopefully that will continue to work, and I'm sure that y'all will let me know if it doesn't. But thank you so much for joining us at West Lafayette Christian. Before we get started this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Your Father in heaven, Lord, we just thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come together. Lord, for fellowship, for friends, Lord, we just, we thank you so much for all these opportunities you give us, Lord, to just gather in your name. Father, we ask you to join us in this time. We ask that your name would be glorified, God, by this worship, by our songs, by our hearts, Lord, as we pour them out before you. And we ask that you be with John today. And anoint his message, Lord, and just build us up and encourage us, Lord, to be your ambassadors. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, well, before we get started today, I wanted to start in Psalm 56, verse 8 to 13. You have taken account of my wanderings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. In God, whose word I praise. In the Lord, whose word I praise. In God, I have put my trust. And I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Your vows are binding upon me, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. For you have delivered my soul from death. Indeed, my feet from stumbling so that I may walk before God in the light of the living. Jesus would say in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. No matter what's going on around us, we have that assurance. And we have enough light in our Lord Jesus for each step, even if we don't know what lies ahead. That's why we praise him. That's why we worship him, because we trust him. It is in his word that we put our faith. So please rise today, and we will sing together and seek that marvelous light of the Lord Jesus. In the marvelous light I run darkness out of shame through the cross you are the truth you are the life you are the way I once was fatherless a stranger with no hope your kindness waking lost its power, death has lost its sting, through the grave you've risen, victoriously, in the marvelous light I'm running, out of darkness, out of shame, through the cross you are the truth, you are the light, you are the way. lost its sting from the grave you've risen victoriously in the marvelous 
this light I'm running Out of darkness, out of shame Through the cross you are the truth You are the light, you are the way In the marvelous light I'm running Out of darkness, out of shame Through the cross you are the truth You are the light, you are the way Lift my hands and spin around See the light that I have found Oh, the marvelous light, marvelous light Lift my hands and spin around See the light that I have found Oh, the marvelous light, marvelous light Sin has lost its power Death has lost its sting From the grave you've risen Victoriously Into marvelous light I'm running Out of darkness, out of shame To the cross you are the truth Marvelous light, I'm running out of darkness, out of shame. Through the cross, you are the truth, you are the light, you are the way. Amen. Praise God for that marvelous light. Peter would say in First Peter 5. Verses 6 through 11. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. But be of sober spirit and be on alert. Your advers adversary, the devil, prowls around you like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That's the part we forget. We hear often, throw your burdens onto the Lord, and he will take care of them, but we forget to humble ourselves. And it's in these times, in these, these moments where we're surrounded by uncertainty in the world around us, that we can have that assurance. We can have that assurance that if we humble ourselves before the Lord, that he will take all of our burdens and all of our cares, and that he will, no matter what we can or can't see ahead of us, no matter what we know or what we don't know, that the Lord knows what's best for us. We praise him because of that today. We run to him because he knows what's best for us. Carried a burden for too long on my head. I wasn't created to bear it again. Hear your invitation. No. 
soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old man knew Jesus when I met you. When you called my name. be seated and children may go to class. Over the last uh, 10 or 11 months, however long it's been now since we've been um, also streaming online. Um, uh, at this point, I'm any, anybody online, I'm speaking to you at the moment. Um, if, if you happen to be new to the congregation in the last year through Facebook or whatever online uh, way you uh, participate in the service, if you're new to us, would you please send us your email address so that we can include you in the life of the church. We can send you information about what else is going on stay in contact with you, include you on our prayer lists and those kinds of things. So just go to the church website, uh, wlchristian.com, and uh, find where you can contact us and just send us your email so we know who you are and we can stay in contact with you as well. James, the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, had, according to tradition, a particular physical characteristic. His knees were severely calloused from all the time he spent kneeling in prayer. He was therefore known as Old Camel Knees. Now this week and next, as we close out the book of James, Old Camel Knees is going to give us some insight regarding prayer. Now sometimes we get into a bad habit of pouncing upon a scripture and making it the last word or the sum total of all truth on that subject. But there's not one verse of scripture that exists within its own universe of exclusive truth. In other words, every verse of scripture exists only in connection with every other verse of scripture. Now the passage before us this morning is a good one on prayer, but it's not the only passage in the Bible that deals with the subject of prayer. Prayer can be understood only in a fuller sense, its fullest sense, when you take into account all that the scriptures have to say about the subject. Well, that's beyond the scope of our time this morning, even next week. We're going to deal only with what James says on the subject of prayer. 
And he has much to say on the subject. But again, it's not the last word on prayer in the New Testament. So if our passage, as we deal with it this week and next, if it raises questions about prayer, what about this, what about that, the answers may actually not be found in this passage. They might be found elsewhere in Scripture. So some of your questions concerning prayer may be answered, and we may address some of those questions as we go, but we can't address them all. So some of your questions may go unanswered. This is just a very limited look at the broad subject of prayer. So we're at James chapter 5, starting at verse 13. If anyone among you is suffering, then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He's to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they're to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who's sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. My brethren, if anyone among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now let's draw out uh, a few pertinent facts concerning prayer before we get into the substance of the passage. James mentions prayer seven times in these final eight verses of this epistle. And he puts, he puts before us several kinds of prayer. Prayer for different circumstances and different situations. You engage with those prayers in a variety of ways. You are sometimes the one who prays. You are sometimes the beneficiary of those prayers. You are sometimes the one prayed for. We have the privilege of praying on behalf of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we have the privilege of having our brothers and sisters in Christ pray for us. James says it in verse 16, pray for one another. Prayer is one of the primary ways we in the body of Christ can support one another. James expresses himself primarily with two main emphases as he talks about prayer. He first of all uses the present tense. He also uses the imperative mood. That means it's a command. And he does that in verses 13, 14, and 16. So with those two emphases in mind, prayer is progressive, it's ongoing, it's continual, it's persistent. It is not expendable. It's a responsibility. James expresses in his own way what the Apostle Paul said. Pray without ceasing. Prayer is also something which, verse 15, should arise out of our faith and as an expression of our faith in Christ. James pointed out from the beginning in chapter 1 that the double-minded man, the unstable man, the man who does not ask in faith ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. What he asks, he is to ask in faith. Prayer allows our faith, gives our, our faith the opportunity to shine. The idea of a faithful Christian being a prayerless Christian is inconceivable. It's incompatible. Prayer is not just the purview of the super saint. Prayer is for you. James uses the example of the prophet Elijah in verses 17 and 18. Well, wait a minute, Elijah, prophet? Well, that certainly seems like he's a super saint if anyone is. No, James says, he was a man with a nature like ours. Elijah was cut from the same bolt of cloth as you and I. It's just that his life was yielded to the Lord. What does that say about you? And then prayer, at its most basic meaning, is talking to God. It's just talking to God. Talking to God in plain, straightforward language. 
Now, on the one hand, that is the most ordinary and common thing you can think of. On the other hand, it is a high and holy privilege. It is a personal audience with the King of Kings. And that should give you goosebumps. I mean, imagine it. The creator of the universe not only allows you, but invites you to confidently, boldly, in prayer, draw near to the throne of grace so that you can receive mercy and find grace to help in your time of need. It is not only a responsibility. Prayer is also an incredible privilege. Now, let's get directly to what James is saying here. Verse 13. Verse 13 can be expressed as a question or as a simple statement. Is anyone among you suffering could just as easily be someone among you is suffering or whoever among you is suffering. You know, suffering is a universal reality. In any given group of people at any given time, someone is suffering something. It may be obvious and evident or it may be concealed or hidden. Someone here this morning or watching us online, participating online, right now is suffering from something. Now the word suffering is a very general word that's used to describe any kind of difficulty. Various translations have it as trouble or troubles, afflicted, hardships, and sorrows. So this can be any kind of suffering. It can be physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, financial, circumstantial, familial, relational, any kind of suffering you can name. Is something weighing you down? Is something pressing in on you? Are you suffering in any way? What is it? Move from the general to the specific. Fill in the blank. Now, once you identify the difficulty for what it is, what is your response to it? Your first response, to freak out? To fall apart? No, he must pray. Now, I'm going to say it again so there's no misunderstanding here. Whoever among you is suffering, he must pray. You are to pray for yourself. That's your first response. Not your second response, certainly not your last response. That's your first responsibility. And it's, it's a present imperative. It's a command to be obeyed now and continually. You pray and you keep praying until the situation is no longer a difficulty or until God brings you resolution. You pray, 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 just as we sang it a little bit ago. Run to the Father again and again and again. Now, suffering as a positive should pull us in, or maybe it's better to think of it as push us in closer to God. Suffering should drive us into the arms of God. David expresses it this way. He says, my heart is in anguish within me. Is he having some trouble? Is he suffering? His heart's in anguish. I would hasten to my place of refuge from the stormy wind and tempest. Is David in his suffering, staying off on his own, distancing himself? No, he is hastening to God. Is that your first reaction, honestly, in the face of suffering? Now, the advantage of your own prayers regarding your own suffering is that you don't have to worry about those prayers being apathetic kinds of prayers. That's something about which you feel very strongly. You know exactly what is at stake, and you know what the issue at hand is. You know how it's affecting you personally. And the deeper you suffer, the deeper should be your interest in prayer. You know, blind Bartimaeus... Blind Bartimaeus had no way to make a living. He had to sit by the road day after day and beg. Uh, he, he, was, he lived off the kindness, the compassion of strangers. Then one day, Jesus came by. When he heard it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And it was probably a lot louder than that. And many were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus said, call him here. So they called the blind man, saying to him, take courage, stand up. He's calling for you. Throwing aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, 
what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. Now that man took the personal responsibility in his need to cry out to Jesus. He wasn't passive about it. He wasn't reserved about it. He cried out to Jesus, and he kept crying out. He would not back off. And what's Jesus' response? Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately, he regained his sight. See, Bartimaeus knew like no one else, as only he could, the reality of his suffering. He cried out to Jesus. Now, look at verse 13. What does James say will happen in response to your prayer regarding your suffering? What's he say? He doesn't say anything. He doesn't say that you're going to experience release from your suffering, even though relief may come. He doesn't even say you may find understanding for why you're suffering the way you are. It's really not until we get to verse 16 that we can peg down an expectation. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. That's what you hang your hope on. And even then, the expectation is that something, something much, is accomplished. But James doesn't tell you what exactly it is that's accomplished. That's going to vary from person to person and circumstance to circumstance. There's more than one way for God to accomplish much and transform our troubles into triumphs. Yes, God can remove the trouble. He can remove the cause of suffering. And that honestly is what you probably have your eye on, right? And that he will do at times. But then there are times when that's not what he does. God can also, in the midst of the suffering, give us the grace we need in the suffering. And that's exactly what God did for the Apostle Paul in response to his thorn in the flesh. Despite Paul's prayers, God did not remove that thorn in the flesh, but he did give Paul the grace he needed. Paul then experienced Christ's power in a way that he had not experienced it before. The command for the sufferer to pray is directly tied to another command. It follows right on its heels. It's the other side of the coin, if you will. Is anyone cheerful? He's to sing praises. This is the opposite side of the coin. Now, this could also be someone among you is cheerful, or whoever among you is cheerful, he's to sing praises. And that makes complete sense. That's exactly the kind of response we would expect from someone who was cheerful. Uh, the word cheerful is literally good passions. It expresses the idea of being in good spirits. Anyone can sing when they're in good spirits. Anyone can sing at a time like that. Now, what James does not say, all right, so here we kind of step aside just a second. What James does not say is that the one who is suffering should also sing praises. There's a place for praise in the midst of suffering. It can be no other way. Back in chapter 1, James says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. David said, Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. And Paul said, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Our times of suffering are, in fact, occasions when our praise becomes a sacrifice to God. Sacrifices cost us something, and that's paid during times of suffering. Johnny Erickson Tata was, uh, was rendered a quadriplegic in a diving accident as a teenager. God, despite her prayers and the prayers of others, did not heal her. She's written... I think God is especially honored when we offer a sacrifice of praise. He's glorified when we offer words of adoration wrenched from a pained and bruised heart. Most of the verses written about praise in God's word were penned by men and women who faced crushing heartaches, injustice, treachery, slander, and scores of other intolerant, intolerable situations. There is hidden power in praise. The Holy One inhabits the praises of Israel. You are rarely closer to God 
or rather God is rarely closer to you than when you are lifting up the sacrifice of praise to him. Are you suffering? Pray. Are you suffering? Praise. James now speaks to a more specific kind of suffering in verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Now this could be just like 13, uh, verse 13, just as easily be someone is sick among you or whoever among you is sick. Now sick, again, is a general word for any kind of weakness. It's a word that literally means without strength or to have no strength. It's to be weak or feeble. It's almost universally translated as sick. Now James has in mind here no minor inconveniences. He is speaking about significant weakness or sickness. This is suffering beyond that of verse 13. It verges on incapacitation. Now what's the sick person to do in this case? Freak out? Fall apart? No, he must call for the elders of the church. Now the assistance of others is required. There are times when you pray for yourself. There are times when reinforcements are needed. There's no shame in the need for others to come alongside you and pray with you and for you. Now this is again an incumbent personal responsibility. The one who is sick or those responsible for the sick person. You recall the friends of the lame man who brought him to Jesus in order to be healed, right? This means that the one who is sick is to take the initiative in summoning the elders. You know, the elders don't have a sixth sense. The elders don't know. We don't know when you're sick, when you're in the hospital, unless you let us know or someone on your behalf lets us know. So first things first, when you're sick, you make others aware of your situation. The elders then carry out a twofold responsibility. They anoint the sick individual with oil. Literally, it's having anointed. In other words, the anointing with oil, even though it's mentioned second, occurs first. The word used by James is used in the Old Testament for three Hebrew words, which mean to anoint, to rub, or to wash. Now, there are three main explanations usually given for, for uh, this, this action that's described by James. Some see it as describing the ancient and common practice of pouring or rubbing oil on an individual. Now, there was nothing unusual about the oil. It was just common, everyday olive oil. You know, olive oil is used primarily today in cooking. In those days, it was multi-purpose oil. It was the three-in-one oil of its day, or the WD-40 of its day. Now, anointing with oil scripturally was done for a number of reasons. It was an expression of joy and festivity. It was used in the consecration of priests and kings. It was used to extend honor to someone else. It was used for medicinal purposes. And it was used even in exorcism. Anointing with oil, then, conveys honor and blessing. It's representative of the Lord's special blessing. And if I was to have to pick one explanation that I found to be the most reasonable or the, the one I would follow, it's, it's this explanation, that this is a very literal description of what James is speaking of. But there are a couple of other explanations. Others home in on one aspect of anointing with oil. And they see James here directing the sick to seek out the best, the best medical care that is available to them. In this scenario, the doctors do their thing and the elders do their thing. The sickness is treated with medicine and prayer. It further emphasized that asking the elders to pray for your physical healing while you ignore medical treatment is not a spiritual attitude, but it's just very foolish. And then others see this simply as a metaphorical description of the elders of the church tangibly refreshing, assisting, encouraging, comforting, and strengthening the weak believer through prayer and other practical means. The oil here is symbolic of the body of Christ in action as it practically ministers to the needs of suffering saints in blessing them. Anointing with oil. Now, the elders follow up this anointing with prayer. Prayer over the sick individual. The elders do this 
uh, anointing in oil and prayer in the name of the Lord. It's under his direction, under his guidance. And then the elders do this in faith. They are not like the doubting or double-minded man back in chapter 1. Now, the sick believer can rightly expect three things uh, in response to this. First, the prayer will restore the one who is sick. The King James has it as, shall save the sick. Now, the, the use of the word restore or save seems a little ambiguous here, perhaps intentionally ambiguous. Does it refer to his body or his soul? The same word is used to speak uh, of the action of salvation in our life. When we talk about someone is saved, that's the same word that's used here by James. So don't presume that this must always or only mean physical restoration. Now the elders at West Lafayette Christian have, have done this in the, in the past. We've anointed with oil and prayed, and this person seems to be healed. And then, in this case, this person seems not to be healed. Well, not everyone finds the healing they want when they want it. In the latter case, however, that's not to presume or assume that that person was not restored according to the grace of God. Second, it says the Lord will raise him up. This is also ambiguous. Raise his body from his sickbed or raise his spirits. Now, we live under a common notion uh, that's erroneous. And if we're not careful, it can, it can ironically be quite crippling to us. And it's the notion that if I'm sick, in whatever physical or mental form that takes, I must be healed. It's God's will that I be healed. I must be healed, or life, or at least quality of life, is somehow diminished or lessened. I must be healed to enjoy a blessed and abundant life. No, Scripture says I must have Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior to enjoy abundant life, regardless of the prevailing circumstances of my life. Abundant life in Christ has little or nothing to do with a carefree life. In the circumstances described by James, you can trust that the Lord will restore you. Now that may mean by His grace something other than merely physical healing. Physical healing always expires. There's an expiration date on physical healing. Something eventually gets everyone. Everyone healed by Jesus later died for some other cause or reason. God's grace, however, does not expire. It is sufficient always. You may think that you... You may think that your real need is healing, but healing or not, your real need is God's grace. Don't forget the words of James or of Job. Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Slaying me is about as far away from healing as I can possibly get. Is your hope in the Lord quickened? Is your trust in the Lord deepened, whether you're healed in answer to prayer or not? If you can say amen to the will of God, whatever that might be in your life and whatever it might look like in your life, then the Lord has raised you up. He has taken you to life on a new level which you were not experiencing before and which you could not have experienced otherwise. You're experiencing, like Paul, the power of Christ which you would not otherwise have known. The overriding point here is that God will meet you in the midst of your struggle. He may or may not bring that struggle to an end, but by his grace, he will restore you and he will raise you up in the midst of your struggle. And then third, James says, his sins will be forgiven. Sins? Oh, where'd that come from? The phrase, if he's committed sins, is expressed in the perfect tense. That's a past action with lasting results. Some therefore charge that the present sickness in question here was due to past sin. Now there is to be sure some suffering and sickness that is the consequence of sin in our lives. The discipline of God is sometimes the consequence of sin in a person's life. But to say that the sickness in question is due to sin, period, is to go too far. 
It's to be as Job's friends who attributed his suffering to unconfessed sin in his life. Job was not suffering because of sin. He was actually suffering because he was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. It was the exact opposite. The if in if he has committed sin tells us that sin may not be the root cause of his sickness or his weakness. See, we must never, like Job's friends, presume that sin is the cause of the sickness. Nor should we presume a lack of faith on the part of the individual as the reason for the sickness. Only the individual can make that kind of determination and then must decide what he or she is going to do about it. We'll talk more about that next week. So the presence of suffering and sickness is not itself sufficient to say that sin is, or at least always is, the root cause or reason for the suffering or sickness. Sins, however, James says, when present, will be forgiven. Are you sick? Have you prayed? Have you praised? Have you called the elders of the church? Now next week we're going to come back and we're going to continue looking at the subject of prayer as old camel knees unpacks it for us throughout these uh, remaining few verses. I want you to think once again for a moment about the oil, the oil in this uh, anointing of oil. The oil was nothing special. The oil has no sacramental properties. The oil itself does not convey uh, any healing grace in and of itself. It's ordinary olive oil. God does, however, tie himself and his actions to this tangible token. And God does this in other ways throughout the scriptures. In the Lord's Supper, he takes the simple elements of the bread and the cup to convey deep truths and his promises to his people. You know, we don't trust in the bread and the cup to convey God's grace to us. But we are reminded to trust in the Lord and in his good promises to us. That we have a Savior who would so give himself in such a way for each one of us uh, means that we have the salvation which can only be ours through faith in his name. So let's focus on him in these next few moments as we remember his suffering and his death. Father, we just thank you for uh, your son, Jesus. We thank you that, that he did offer himself uh, wholly and completely so that each one of us here by faith could, could uh, be restored to life, to know what forgiveness is, to know what the grace, your grace is in our life. Father, help us to understand that and experience it more deeply in just these next few moments as we focus our our faith and our trust in you as we uh, allow you to fill us by your spirit to go out and live this week and empty ourselves into our families, our communities, uh, wherever it is you take us. Father, help us to uh, be a vehicle of blessing for you. And Father, as we come to times in life when things get difficult, when, when uh, the way gets hard, when, it, when we're physically being pressed in upon and suffering, perhaps even sick, Father, that we turn our trust and our attention to you and you only as as the uh, source of of, uh, our restoration and uh, uh, the source of being lifted up, even the source of our healing. Father, we just, we turn our, our, our faith to you as the great physician to touch our lives and our hearts. And Father, most importantly, we just pray that your grace would flood into our lives and that uh, your will would be done to your glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, John, for that message. And, uh, and I pray that many of you were moved by that as I was. Because I know that we all have lots of things going on in our lives. And we all have lots of challenges and struggles. But we're called to be a people of prayer. And I know I need to pray more. Because when we don't pray, we're only trusting ourselves. And when we pray, we're trusting God. It's really that simple. We have a tendency to complicate it. Paul, speaking to the Romans in chapter 6, he was speaking to them. Uh, he started out this, this, this section or this chapter, if you will. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that God's grace may abound? You know, John alluded to the fact, you know, he, Paul said to God, please remove this thorn on my side. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Because of that thorn, you're coming to me, Paul. Because of that thorn, you're coming back to me for, for my grace and my help. And Paul would go on to say here, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that is Christ, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ... Having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. I think that's the guy I'm going to trust to answer my prayers. And that's the kind of truth that leads us not only to our knees in prayer, but to look up in praise. So as we sing this last song today, may you claim that promise. May you claim that as you go today. That Christ died for your sin so that you could go boldly to the, th the throne of grace and get help for your problems and issues and the problems of those in your life that you love. Because death has been arrested. We have no more fear. So please rise as we wrap up today. sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested was redeemed only beauty remains I orphan heart was given in my morning grew quiet my feet rose to dance when death was arrested
Father, Lord, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you for your word that is true, that is never changing. Father, we thank you for this church and for this family, and for these opportunities to be encouraged by you, Lord. And we thank you, Father, for the opportunity to be an ambassador for you and for your son. We thank you for him. We thank you for the, the sacrifice that Jesus made so that we would have a way to share this fellowship with you, Lord. We just ask you to build us up and encourage us along the way this week. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, before everybody leaves, I want to make a quick announcement. We will be having a brief meeting uh, regarding the renovation uh, project on the sanctuary. So for those of you who have children in class, if you want to take, you know, five minutes or so to go grab the kiddos, and we'll meet back here in the sanctuary here in about five, ten minutes. Thank you, and have a blessed week.